And welcome, everybody. I'm Marty Goldman. I want to welcome everyone to the January 14th Controversies in Cardiology. We actually have a very exciting uh, topic uh, and a really great panel. Uh, today's topic is atherosclerosis, early detection and prevention, which we normally deal with the other end of the spectrum of atherosclerosis, uh, when to deal with patients, when, which stent, when to stent, uh, when to deal with the acute MI. So here, we're dealing with the other end of the spectrum, trying to catch patients early, uh, subclinical disease, what makes the event of atherosclerosis, um, what causes it, and how it can be imaged and detected early uh, for better prevention. Uh, it's a very uh, exciting topic uh, in which our visiting professor is one of the leading investigators and has contributed tremendous amount uh, to the topic. Um, today's moderator is Raja Hajar, who's author and Janet Ross Professor of Medicine and the director of the Cardiovascular Research Institute. Thank him very much uh, for moderating. The panel, uh, the remaining uh, panel, besides our visiting professor, the Dr. Hajar will introduce in more detail. Uh, J is Juan, ba uh, Juanjo Badamon, as Dr. Fuster would call him, Professor of Medicine, Director of the Atherothrombosis Research Unit. Uh, Chiara Ginearelli, uh, MD, PhD, who's Assistant Professor of Medicine, Cardiology, Assistant Professor of Genetics and Genomic Sciences, the Precision Immunology Institute. Jason Kovacek, uh, MD, PhD, FACC, many other titles, who's Associate Professor of Medicine, Cardiology is uh, an Associate Director of the Interventional Structural Heart Disease. And interestingly enough, he happens to be the principal investigator of the Kovacek lab. That's sort of an interesting coincidence. Dr. Uh, Anu Kinney, uh, MD, MRCP, and FACC, Professor of Medicine, Director of the Cardiac Catheterization Lab, Director of Interventional Cardiovascular uh, Fellowship Program. Uh, and last but certainly not least, um, our, first, our second year fellow, Jason Goodman, who's done a tremendous job in putting together a, a very, very interesting uh, monograph for all of you. Copies are outside, and we'll briefly summarize it. Uh, Jason. Thank you, Dr. Goldman, and thank you, Dr. Taylor, for coming today. I'll just briefly introduce the topic. Atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease is a widely prevalent disease that causes a high degree of morbidity and mortality. While there are many classical risk factors for the development of atherosclerosis, such as hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, and tobacco use, atherosclerosis is increasingly being understood as an inflammatory process. This idea has been gaining a great deal of traction in public attention after recent trials revealed that treatment with the anti-inflammatory medication canakinumab decreases cardiac events without affecting lipids. There has long been an association with inflammation and the development of cardiovascular disease, and this was first borne out in studies that correlated nonspecific inflammatory markers, such as white blood cell counts, and acute phase reactants, such as C-reactive protein and fibrinogen, with cardiovascular risk. As assays improved, the ability to de detect CRP with high sensitivity, specific interleukins and adhesion molecules, as well as other inflammatory markers, such as serum amyloid A protein, further solidified this association. Of these, the strongest predictor has been high sensitivity CRP, which not only correlates with sudden cardiac death and the development of peripheral arterial disease, but also is an independent risk factor for coronary events when adjusted for the more traditional risk factors, including hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, and smoking. There's a complex interconnected web of dozens of inflammatory pathways that is being unraveled at the heart of the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis. To give one such example, take angiotensin. While angiotensin is most well known as an effector of neurohormonal activation as part of the RAS system, leading to hypertension and sequelae, it is now understood as a mediator of inflammation as well. Indeed, angiotensin converting enzyme in the arterial wall leads to local production of angiotensin II, local upregulation of inflammatory adhesion molecules and cytokines, and is associated with the development of atherosclerosis independent of its pressor effects. Taking advantage of this knowledge of the importance of inflammation in the development of atherosclerosis to guide therapy has been challenging. Attempts to, to decrease cardiovascular events with long-term antibiotics, or low-dose methotrexate, for instance, have proved inefficacious. However, the recent Cantos trial, which showed that interleukin-1 beta blockade reduces cardiac events, 
will undoubtedly lead to further research in this area. Another area of promise is utilizing novel imaging techniques to identify inflammatory high-risk plaques that otherwise may be overlooked by traditional angiography. In a study to be published later this month in JAK, PET MRI was able to detect inflammation within arterial walls and within the plaques themselves in a relatively young cohort between 40 and 54 years old with subclinical atherosclerotic disease. This early detection can surely lead to better risk stratification and more aggressive treatment in appropriate patient populations. While the mixed success thus far in therapeutic trials is somewhat disheartening, the complexities of the inflammatory system begs the question of whether the correct molecular pathways are being targeted, the correct medications are being studied, and at the correct doses. A deeper understanding of these mechanisms could potentially lead to novel drug targets or perhaps new uses for existing medications. Coupled with novel imaging techniques, improved detection of the pathophysiologic processes that lead to atherosclerotic disease states themselves could lead to earlier diagnosis, improved primordial and primary prevention, and mitigation of morbidity and mortality in this widespread and far-reaching disease. Thank you. OK, um, thank you very much for coming this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Fuster couldn't make it today, so uh, I'm uh, filling his very big shoes, so it's going to be only partial filling. It's a real pleasure to have Dr. Taylor with us today uh, from Emory. Dr. Taylor is the chief of cardiology uh, at Emory, um, and his training is really uh, both in uh, physiology and uh, medicine, and more specifically in biomedical engineering. He uh, received his PhD in physiology from Johns Hopkins University, and then uh, his medical degree from Harvard. He did his uh, internal medicine training at uh, BI uh, in Boston, and then after that uh, started at the cardiology division at Emory University. So if you look at his uh, CV, if you follow his CV, Dr. Taylor has really been uh, at the intersection of biomedical engineering and vascular uh, biology, and his uh, chair actually is in uh, vascular medicine at uh, uh, Emory, where he's been there for uh, many years, I guess, since he uh, finished his uh, cardiology fellowship. And he's really started a program there, I remember uh, when I was there about you know, a decade ago, uh, a very kind of fruitful program between Georgia Tech and their biomedical engineering and their whole engineering department, and they're very well known for that, and uh, cardiology division at Emory. So it was a very unique interaction uh, at that time that he had started maybe even 15, 20 years ago, and has really been uh, extremely productive uh, over the years. So uh, Dr. Taylor's laboratory is focused on uh, really obtaining a better understanding of the role of vascular inflammation. And just as we heard uh, with Jason and the pathogenesis of uh, vascular disease. Uh, so he uses a number of animal models, imaging techniques, and uh, engineering work and mechanical uh, work to better understand uh, the interaction between a vascular wall that's diseased and um, atherosclerosis. Um, so uh, it's a real pleasure to have uh, Dr. Taylor here uh, join us today uh, and join our panel to uh, really discuss this, uh, again, uh, re-emergence of uh, inflammation and atherosclerosis. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. So with that, we're going to, even before the panel starts, we have this plaque for you to thank you for uh, being here. So this is just from the uh, faculty and fellows of uh, the Cardiovascular Institute at Mount Sinai. And this is the Sharma uh, thank professorship. You. Thank, you thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. It's a real pleasure to be here. Just a picture of this one. All right. Okay, so please join our panel here. So uh, the other members are uh, Chiara, can you join us? Juan, Jason, and I think uh, Dr. Keeney is here too. Uh, I think Dr. Fayad is, uh, cannot make it this afternoon. Um, he had a medical emergency. Yeah. 
Okay, so um, I think uh, we're gonna start uh, by asking Dr. Taylor to sort of really give us a synopsis of the sort of ups and downs of uh, this field of inflammation at the cross section of atherosclerosis over the last, over his uh, career when he started uh, and where does he think the field is going? Okay, and it's like two words, two words or less. Huh? That's right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's open. It's open ended. So, yeah. um, I, I, so it has it has been sort of an interesting field because it, there was, uh, you know, a lot of this role of inflammation and in vascular disease got really started with the study of reactive oxygen species, and and we all sort of lived through the fever of, of clinical trials with antioxidants and thinking, well, that's the, the key for everything. And then a lot of those antioxidant trials sort of sort of died out, right? And there were a lot of negative results. And, and, and so the, then sort of the inflammation hypothesis sort of dwindled a little bit. And there were many permutations of it. You know, I mean, people, a lot of emphasis on endothelium and, and the role of the endothelium was not a little less emphasis on the, probably the greater complexity. So, so I think the field's been sort of up and down and, and a bit of a rebirth and as people have, I think a lot of it has been fueled by, by stronger tools as we were talking about today, the ability to, to look in detail at, at, at the inflammatory cells and the immune response in the vessel wall has really taken things to a new level. And, and we start thinking in a much more critical fashion about what specific modulators are important and sort of this, this sort of symphony of, of immune responses. And I think that's where the future is to me as I look at it, is, is really, um, again, fueled by these uh, probably more, much more powerful tools, single cell, our greater uh, appreciation of epigenetics and the regulation of the inflammatory response. Uh, those seem to be sort of major areas for us as, in the future. Great. Two minutes or less. So. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, I mean, the composition of these, um, the plaques, the atherosclerotic legions are uh, clearly uh, have been targeted before, um, sometimes with, you know, kind of a hammer, uh, where maybe a, a much more targeted approach uh, ne was needed. Uh, do we think that the failures of many of the trials were Infla inflammation was targeted uh, until recently uh, was due to kind of uh, different therapies that were not appropriate or was it mainly due to the fact that uh, the concept uh, is, is not correct? Okay. I, I guess that I am an old fashioned and I always follow the same thing association does not mean causality. And I am not going to say that inflammation does not play a role in atherosclerosis because it does. The problem is that we have to really focus in what type of inflammation, if you allow me to separate inflammation, it's important. And the typical example, we have seen it already with the cantos and the metrotexate. One, reduce events, but people die from septicemia because we are forgetting that one of the responses is when the endothelium is injured, then the inflammatory response is a defensive mechanism, it's not bad. What happened that if you have it for chronically, then it becomes like the yin and the yang. And I think that this is the problem that inflammation, I see it as a major player in the genesis and progression of the disease, but Inflammation as a therapeutic target is very complex because we are putting inflammation in the same basket when we know that there are different inflammatory markers that they are going to be responsible for different responses. And as Dr. Taylor says, different type of cells. So you don't want to go against inflammation. You want to go against specific inflammation. And please don't ask me which one is the right uh, answer. Okay, so um, I think uh the issues of you know the treatments are, are are gonna come up as we sort of talked a little bit more about the different cell types. But you know, let's get back, you know, clinically. So Dr. Keeney, as far as you're concerned, I mean, as the end of the catheter, do you care if it's active inflammation or chronic inflammation or 
medium-sized inflammation? Isn't it all about trying to open the vessel? And really, it doesn't matter whether what, how you got to the inflammatory, the, the inflammation and, and the atherosclerosis. Many times what happens, um, you know, if they have come for stable coronary artery disease as a positive stress test and have angina, these are chronic disease who have obstructive lesion. And then there's another group where present as ACS because of the ruptured plaque, and I think that is what the discussion here should, is, that why did the plaque rupture? Who is the one, um, the reason for a plaque rupture, whether it's an ST elevation MI or non-QMI? And there, definitely, I think inflammation uh, is very important. But like you mentioned, when the patients are presenting to us, our goal is to have the artery open and to make sure you know there's uh, remi flow restored and uh, the myocardium uh, is getting enough blood supply. But subsequent management of these patients who will have um, you know non-obstructive disease is definitely targeted to reduce the inflammation. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let, let's get into the, uh, the different cell types that uh, uh, are within these uh, lesions. And uh, clearly for decades, um, we've seen the roles of uh, monocytes and macrophages play a big role um, in, uh, in the pathogenesis and uh, extension of these uh, lesions. Um, so, Chiara, tell us a little bit more about some of the new findings and maybe some of the introduced, some of the new uh, modalities that are being used um, to actually detect the different cell types within plaques. So, uh, based on the concept that different cell types uh, are present in the atherosclerotic arterial wall, uh, um, it's important now to try to understand what is their uh, com the composition is, what are the cell-to-cell -cell interactions, and, uh, and to do that, um, we have now new tools that allow to look into um, cell composition at the single cell level, not just in animal models of atherosclerosis, but in uh, uh, human tissues. And, um, and using these tools, you can really define the granularity of the um, atherosclerosis immune composition. And uh, we found uh, initially um, in, uh, in our studies that um, uh, there are different cell types and uh, um, the composition uh, changes based on uh, um, the, the stage of the disease. Uh, but essentially, um, the innate, innate immune component doesn't seem to be uh, so striking overrepresented, uh, while the adaptive uh, T cells seems to be predominant. And this is well known. Uh, there are uh, pathology publications that shows that T cells are very uh, highly represented in uh, in T cell in uh, in atherosclerosis. And now we are kind of rediscovering these. And uh, we have also the ability of not just looking at their presence as T cells, but looking at their differentiation, the functional state, because you can look also at the gene level. And I think that this type of tools will help us in uh, identifying uh, at the mechanistic level uh, important uh, signaling pathways and genes that might be important useful for future um, immunotherapies that are more specific uh, for sub subgroup of patients. Thanks, Karen. So, I mean, we'll come back on the issue of T cells and we'll try to sort of probe a little bit more of uh, uh, the kind of uh, emergence as uh, one of the important cell types. Um, so, within, within the uh, atherosclerotic plaques, uh, there are clearly many transformative events that are occurring. And uh, Jason, you've been thinking about this uh, for a long time in terms of how these uh, cells, uh, endothelial cells or uh, mesenchymal cells and their transition occurs. So uh, within the context of inflammation, uh, how are these cells uh, put in specific pathways? Thanks, Roger. It's a great question. And, and um, just to set it up, 
You know, classic thinking in, in atherosclerosis is that there's several key cell types, which is endothelial cells, smooth muscle cells, fibroblasts, and inflammatory cells. And um, the work from our lab and, and several other labs around the world has shown that it's really not that, including Chiara, has shown that it's really not that black and white and that there's a lot of transformative events, as Dr. Hajar was just saying, including from endothelial cells to a fibroblast-like cell phenotype. And as, uh, and as others have shown, and Chiara has also shown that smooth muscle cells can also transdifferentiate towards macrophages. Uh, the extent of this transdifferentiation is still being worked out, but it seems to be quite significant. The functional importance of this and the contribution to the disease pathology uh, appears substantial, but whether it's a causative part of the problem or just an epiphenomenon that's happening on the side and there's no real con disease driving consequence, we still don't know. But the, the boundaries between these cell populations is becoming increasingly blurred as, for example, there seems to be multiple different origins for fibroblasts, several different origins for macrophages, potentially <coughs> different origins for smooth muscle cells from resident smooth muscle cells, mesenchymal progenitor cells, and so on. So the, these boundaries are sort of getting more blurry uh, the deeper we get into the biology of atherosclerosis. But this is a very hot area of research. Kiara, you might want to comment on the smooth muscle macrophage. Um, <coughs> yes, there are... Um, different labs and uh, one of um, the labs that probably focused more on these aspects is the lab of Gary Owens and uh, the idea that is beyond this is that macrophages are not just uh, derived from immune cells but in fact uh, the vascular smooth muscle cells as they enter the intima, the atherosclerotic intima, um, um, undergo a uh, reprogramming and they indeed become uh, uh, macrophage-like and they are able to engulf lipid. Uh, and um, probably this is a mechanism that uh, contributes to um, uh, plaque and uh, the generation of foam cells in the plaque. And this has been uh, shown by uh, Dr. Owen in, uh, in mice, but also in, uh, in humans. Um, and in our lab, we were able to see that, um, you know, confirm the presence of uh, macrophages that are difficult to uh, define as uh, immune cells in our hand. Uh, so in essence, there is a lot of plasticity and uh, uh, switching from one cell type or the other. And, uh, uh, we're just scratching the surface, I think, in this respect. Thank you. So, I mean, clinically what we care about, obviously, uh, especially in the acute setting, is really the flow through the, uh, the arteries. Um, so imaging has become extremely important in this setting, and more and more sophisticated imaging uh, is being applied to try and kind of understand where these plaques start, when do they start, when is a good time to intervene. All these questions are being addressed by uh, novel uh, modalities, whether they're invasive or non-invasive. So let's start sort of thinking about or you know, discussing uh, part of that, that question in kind of the context of uh, inflammation. So Juan, what do you think of that in terms of imaging for uh, these types of uh, lesions. I agree with what was said before. I mean, we are just touching the tip of the iceberg. But one of my concerns is, and this is why I think that the, the work that Chiara is doing, working with the cell, is important, because we have always to remember that atherosclerosis is a diffuse disease, but it's locally manifested. So, and the question is, we already know cholesterol, inflammation, blood pressure is all over our body. But the invasive, they know very well, and Dr. Taylor mentioned today that there are certain areas that they are more prone to develop plaque. But not all the plaques break. And my question is, if you have the same genes and you have the same risk, the cardiovascular risk factor systemically, what is the trigger that tells this plaque and not this one to rupture? Because what takes the patient to the hospital is the plaque rupture and thrombosis. So this is what they think, that the only way that we will know what happened with inflammation is if we are working in the local factors that makes this transition from cells in the local level. 
as long as we work at the systemic level and measuring things, it's, I think we will not go anywhere. What can we do so far? Imaging. And imaging, but again, in imaging we already know for the studies with Zahi, is that there are certain cells, lesions, that they have activated macrophages. But again, we are working with a very crude technique. It's the 18 glucose captation. And we don't know what type of macrophage is this. We don't know the, the epigenetic morphation um, manifestation of these macrophages. I think that eventually in the next 10 or 15 years, using imaging and cell-to-cell -cell studies, we will be able to open up the different layers of inflammation, and then it will be a therapeutic target. But so far, I guess that uh, we're very far away. And the best thing that we have is imaging for research purposes, not for clinical purposes. So Bob, do you want to expand yeah. on that? Just want to maybe disagree with you a little bit, OK? Uh, yeah, hey, you know, this whole debate of the vulnerable plaque versus the vulnerable patient, you know, that's what sort of comes up. And, you know, there are certainly data that show that, you know, if you take someone who comes in and dies with an infarct and, and then you sort of look around in the renal arteries or the non-infarct related arteries, you'll find, you know, plaques that look more vulnerable there too or perhaps even ruptured. So, so, so I think it is, I think there is a big local component, but there is also the systemic component. And, and I think that comes through with triggers as we think about things, you know, like mental stress and, uh, you know, smoking or acute, um, you know, exposure to a toxin or something like that. So, so, so I think it's sort of a mixed bag, and and you know, and that's sort of an eternal debate again, the the, the vulnerable plaque versus vulnerable patient, and, and I think that's what makes, uh, you know, the imaging is sort of another real challenge, and I think we're all been involved in some big NIH programmatic grants trying to, you know, use nanotechnology to identify, you know, vulnerable plaques, and, and it was very frustrating. And in the end, uh, you know, a lot of the challenge was finding, well, what's the target? You know, what is, and, and it's probably because there's not an it. You know, that's not a, not a simple target. We were talking about systems biology approaches and, and more sophisticated approaches, but I, I think the reality is, is when we first started on this journey to think about, well, we can, well, we'll just, we'll image VCAM or, you know, and that's successful in some regards, but it's, some of these signals are much more diffuse than that and much less specific and the signal to noise is a problem. And then the other challenge with them is temporally. Or we often look at things that start disease versus things that may be involved in plaque rupture and more advanced and those, those may be pretty different. I, I totally agree. In fact, <coughs> the pathologists are telling us that the plaque rupture is a very common fashion. And I didn't mention it because we are focusing the lesion, but my group and Chiara, we have been working for a long time in the vulnerable blood, is the systemic tissue factor and the microparticles, whatever you want to call it. And this is why I'm telling you that if you work on the plaque, the plaque is only one of the players. It takes two to tango. But because of the topic I didn't mention, because I am a bloody guy, I like the thrombosis. But this is why we didn't mention, but I totally agree. And again, is this part of inflammation or not? I think so. But then if you ask me where is this coming from, which, which type of cells, I don't know how to tell you. So um, from an operator standpoint, uh, both for Dr. Keeney and Jason, I mean, what is it from imaging that you'd like to get uh, to sort of better guide the way that you intervene on a patient, whether it's acutely or uh, more subacutely? Well, I mean, in the, like I mentioned, if there is obstructive lesion, and if we think there is something that we need to intervene on, physiology is the way we would like to go where we will measure the pressure across the lesion, fractional flow reserve, and that's, that's the gold standard as well as the ACCHA guideline um, to follow. Now comes the question when you have a moderate uh, lesion, especially if you're dealing with a major as, uh, left main or a proximal vessel and or you have already a stent and you think that, um, you know, you're not sure just based on angiography whether you want to intervene or no. There are uh, two kinds of one which has already made it to guideline, which is intravascular ultrasound, you know, where you can see what the plaque itself is. You get a cross-sectional area which tells you what's the diameter stenosis and some to some uh, uh, amount the plaque morphology. 
So there are studies to show that if you have a certain cross-sectional area, you need to intervene and uh, some other cross-sectional area, you can uh, leave that alone. And the famous trial was a prospect, which did show that when you had um, the so-called TICFA, where you had you know, the thin fibrous cap, when they left them alone, that there was uh, incidence uh, of uh, um, event uh, at one year. The other newer modality, which is uh, optical coherence tomography, which is um, uh, uh, coming into prevalence now, is that you are able to see the lesion better um, uh, with that. Um, and what is more important is not just understanding the morphology of the plaque that you're seeing. You know, what is it made of lipid? Is it made of calcium? Is it made of fibrous tissue? That is what we all want to know. Third, more uh, important is what I think uh, relate to this discussion is fibrous cap. I think as an interventionalist and what all cardiologists know is that if your fibrous cap is thin, is that particular lesion is likely has caused an event that brought the patient to the lab or likely to cause a future event. Uh, event. And if there is an obstruction on top of that, that's the time we can take care of it with the stent. Thank you. Jason? Yeah, I think Dr. Kinney summarized it very nicely The um, I mean, I think inflammation really acutely comes in, factors into how we do a PCI. I think the main factors are the presence or not of significant calcification or thrombosis it will impact how the stent's deployed and put in. But at this stage, I don't think inflammation really has an impact. If there's an obstructive lesion or it's uh, STEMI or it's significant by FFR, then the lesion gets stented whether it's uh, inflammatory or not. But uh, I think the... You know, I agree with what Dr. Batterman was saying. I think the role for systemic imaging is, is very helpful as a research tool and maybe the day will come where we measure the systemic vascular inflammation as a tool for deploying agents such as canakinumab or others. Um, but I, I don't think that lesional imaging is, is really there yet for guiding us in terms of inflammation at least. Thank you. Um, so Jason Goodman, I guess. Uh, so you, you've heard Dr. Fuster, I mean, one of his pet peeves is the fact that um, diagnosing peripheral obstruction using non-invasive techniques can give you a really nice window into what's happening at the uh, uh, coronary level and also uh, at the cerebral level. So uh, through your readings and through what you've researched, what, what are some of the concepts there and what are some of the studies that have been um, seen or, or, or conducted right. uh, to, about this? Yeah, okay. uh, so it looks like in terms of peripheral atherosclerosis, the first place that generally is affected is the femoral artery. Mm -hmm. We saw that in the study that I mentioned in my little introduction uh, with PET MRI, I was able to detect subclinical atherosclerotic disease and inflammation and a lot of the inflammation starts in the femoral artery, and, and that um, study was based on prior studies that detected uh, subclinical atherosclerosis, again, with ultrasound, and additionally with some of these, um, I think it was mentioned earlier, other kind of PET imaging and nuclear imaging where we can tag other cells or, or inflammatory molecules, particularly IL-2 has been tagged, and that's been associated with early disease in carotid arteries, but again, I don't think this stuff is widely used clinically yet. It's still just research-oriented, as been, has been mentioned. In terms of being able to correlate that with coronary arteries, um, while there is a lot of upside to PET imaging, one complication of that, especially using FDG, it's a marker of um, metabolic activity. And as we all know, myo myocytes are very metabolically active. So to be able to differentiate the signal from the noise in cardiac myocytes versus coronary arteries is very difficult with FDG, but there are other nuclear tracers that are, for instance, specific to macrophages that help to resolve what's going on in the coronary arteries, more specifically uh, from the background level of metabolic activity. But again, this has not been widely used clinically yet. It's still just kind of research. In fact, I think those haven't even been tested in humans yet, so it's probably a long way away. Thank you. So I think one of the interesting concepts here is that Okay, so when we think about trying to diagnose uh, more centrally occurring atherosclerosis and obstructions, you know, we start thinking of carotids and uh, uh, femoral disease. But interestingly, when we look carefully, it's when we have to intervene on a femoral artery or more distally. So when we have to do surgery, 
that's when we really start looking at, okay, does this patient have coronary disease because that's gonna increase our surgical risk, so let's fix that. I think the inflammatory responses, I mean, what we're seeing and what we're sort of, what, what this kind of uh, type of research or this line of research is interesting because it really will hopefully allow us to detect patients earlier and detect coronary disease or cerebrovascular disease at an early stage where intervention uh, may be possible. So, Juan, what do you think? But I guess that all these things is like when you are playing lottery, right? The more tickets you buy, the more chances you will get the lotto. Because again, we are going to uh, measure something totally systemic, but then the manifestation is local. So what we are learning from the PESA trial that Fuster is doing in Madrid is you know that there are, if you have an atherosclerosis burden of 100, and then I have 10, you have 10 more chances of having an event. But the question that we really need to know is what is the plaque that is going to be responsible for an event? Because we already know that unfortunately all of us, we already have lesions because we already know this is, the, the question is how can we detect the plaque that is more active or composition or whatever you want to call it? And probably that one is responsible for inflammation. But if you measure my, inflammatory levels of uh, CRP or something like that, you only get half of the picture. You know, the ideal is if we can pinpoint what is the right plug, and then you can intervene. Because what we're doing now is you are intervening based in clinical uh, evidences. And you know, for instance, we didn't talk about something that is becoming fashionable, that is the stent neoaterothrombosis. So that is something that until now we didn't know because we didn't have the long studies to, to, to check. But now with Renovirman is telling us that when you put the stent because it's a foreign material, develops an inflammatory reaction because the macrophages goes there. And again, it's good because you treat the symptoms, but in the long term, it seems to generate this neoaterosclerosis that we still don't know anything. And probably you are going to tell me it's because inflammation is involved. And I will tell you, yes, because the macrophages are going to be there. But you see, the problem is that we are talking about a very abstract thing that is inflammation, and we want to put it in a very specific uh, situation, and we are still very far away from it. But I think the concept that the inflammation early on can be intervened on, as opposed to when you try to intervene at a very late stage when you already have obstruction, is a very different... I mean, you have two different, very different scenarios. I mean, they're continuous, but the extremes are going to be very different. And when you intervene on the extremes, you're going to get different results. I agree. If Jason and me, we have the same glucose, the same uh, blood pressure, the same cholesterol, and unfortunately, he has more inflammation, he will have more chances of having an event, because we already know that. But you know, the important thing is, what do we do with this? Because you remember, when everybody got into the boat of inflammation because of the Jupiter, I remember that when Paul came here and I, I asked him, listen, I go to your, your office and I am normal with blood pressure, normal with cholesterol, normal with everything, and my, my inflammatory marker goes to 100. What do you do? And then he told me, oh, I will repeat it in about 10 days. Mm -hmm. Say, why? Say, to make sure that you don't have a cavity that you don't have, because you see, the inflammatory markers that we are measuring, there are not cardiovascular specifics. Maybe LP little a, if, we, if you assume that this is an inflammatory marker. And, and this is what they want to say. They play a role, and they raise a flag, but is the culprit of the event? I am no. not so sure. Thank you, Juan. So Jason, um, if you think of the compartment that we're dealing with, I mean, you have uh, multiple cell types that are within this space. The interactions are continuous. It seems to be like the systems biology is wet dream. Uh, is, is system biology giving us any insights into uh, what we're dealing with and how can we uh, get to nodal uh, sure. events that can be intervened on? Sure. So that's a beautiful question, thanks. So, the, um, so just to make sure we're all on the same page, systems biology is looking at um, these 
complicated systems of genes interacting with proteins, interacting with cells, and then a huge sort of gamish of the way sort of New Yorkers interact with New Yorkers, multiple different levels, things going on, different passages and pathways and things. And the, the, the challenge for passing out the systems biology, things that are going on, atherosclerosis at the cellular level, is that until very, very recently, we actually haven't had the tools to start looking at the specific cell level. So comparing the endothelial networks to the smooth muscle networks to the macrophage networks and so on. So at this point, most of the studies have just taken the whole vessel wall and looked at the whole of the system's biology happening on all the cell types together. It's called bulk sequencing or looking at the bulk vessel wall. Uh, and, but just now, studies are starting to do use single cell RNA sequencing, which is basically looking at the genetic signature of individual cells. And I think the next five to 10 years, and it'll be not the case only for atherosclerosis, but also for heart failure and a whole lot of diseases, that we start to resolve the different interactions of different cell types uh, at the cellular level and the compartmental level. So that'll include looking at how endothelial cells are interacting with inflammatory cells, uh, and also, for example, in heart failure, looking at the interactions between inflammation, cardiomyocytes, the vasculature, and so on. All of this, I think, is, is an exciting frontier that will come into the fore in the next five to ten years. Thank you. So, Bob, if you add biomechanical uh, stresses on top of this uh, kind of interacting cells, where you have shear stress that's contributing to the... Uh, uh, formation of the plaques, extension of the plaques. How does that play also in this kind of genetic background and uh, different cell types? So uh, shear stress is uh, critical. So as we know, atherosclerosis has a predilection for forming at sites of bifurcations where there's turbulent flow. It also has a predilection for forming at sites of low shear. So the, that is thought to lead to endothelial cell activation. Uh, it potentially also triggers that pathway I spoke about before of the cell switching of endothelial cells to mesenchymal phenotype. It, it definitely changes uh, the endothelial cell phenotype, causes endothelial dysfunction, and leads to plaque formation at sites of bifurcation. It can also be a nidus for uh, propagating a plaque. So once you have a small plaque forming, that sets up further turbulent flow and as a feed-forward pathway, to further, de further progress the lesion. So the interactions of shear stress, endothelial biology, inflammation are very complicated, but I think they get to the core of what actually causes a plaque to progress. Uh, and ultimately the role of shear, disturbed shear in causing plaque rupture is I think yet to be passed out fully, but it may turn out to be an important factor towards the end, perhaps particularly in plaque erosion uh, where the, the endothelium is actually denuded. And I think that's, uh, an in, a very interesting research area we're going to see a lot more about uh, as a second type of, uh, of, of uh, a lesion that causes thrombosis and clinical events after the, pl the plaque rupture that we've been talking about so far. Thank you, Bob. You've had a lot of experience with mechanical uh, effects on uh, the vessel wall. Uh, yeah, I mean, and, I mean, summarized it very nicely. The I think the challenge is, is some of the spatial heterogeneity is literally a cell apart. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you sort of map your way across some of these uh, areas of disturbed flow, you know, you literally have heterogeneity from one cell to the next in a very small microenvironment. So I, th I think that's a, a real challenge, but also very interesting. And then the other is, you know, is since we all have this disturbed flow all the time, I mean, clearly it's a you know, important factor, but it's not sufficient. And you, you know, how these things interplay, uh, I, th I think is, is really interesting. And, uh, and you know, just to add to the plaque erosion, I think we have a little different take on plaque erosion in that um, in some of our studies, it appears there's not a lot of endothelial denudation. And there's some controversy about that. You know, how much of it is, you know, sort of flow, sort of washing off or hurting the endothelium versus something else, but it's, it's clearly not a classic inflammatory response like we see with a more traditional atherosclerotic plaque. So it is a different disease process. And, and again, so that's another layer of complexity and uh, it's gonna make it more challenging to understand that. If you allow me to make it even more complex, because today I learned a lot with your fluid dynamics lecture this morning, but Roger, so you will remember Michael Gimbroni when we were in Boston. This guy was able to take a Petri dish with endothelial cells. When they are exposed to a high shear rate, those endothelial cells, they generate an 
anti-atherosclerotic mm. environment. The same cell, you switch to oscillatory flow, and the same cells, they start generating a pro-atherosclerosis environment. So this is telling you why, because the endothelial cells, they have the shear stress responding elements that they will tell you that you take the same cells, and depending on the flow, it will be a good cell or will be a bad cell. So this is why I'm telling you that we are talking as such a focal disease that when you talk about genital, it's a difficult thing, but again, the only way to answer this is with the biological networks. Does uh, shear stress affect the composition of the, uh, the plaques? I mean, are more, uh, are macrophages versus T cells more resistant to oscillatory uh, shear versus uh, other types of cells? I guess I'm not sure what you mean by the last part about being more resistant, but, but certainly, um, you know, the flow environment is correlated, associated, and then causality for plaque development is what's hard to do. I mean, there are certainly several groups and, and uh, investigators here and elsewhere who have looked longitudinally at individuals and looked at areas of their flow environment and see what happens to plaque progression with time. And, uh, and I think the data are a little confusing, partially because a lot of the flow measurements or flow analyses are sort of lump sum that they look at the total, whether it's high shear or low show, not sort of the dynamic component of it. So I think it's a little hard to interpret. Uh, um, it was a paper from, our, from another, uh, Dr. Samadhi at our group recently, in his group showing that it, at, uh, at high shear was associated with worse outcomes and more, more likely to have MI uh, down the road. And, and so the question is, is it really high shear or is it the complexity of that environment with flow oscillations? Um, and, and again, because of the sort of micro part of it, you have high shear here and literally a half a millimeter later, you have a, a low area uh, just sort of downstream from the nozzle effect to the, the stricture effect, which could be very, very low sh mean shear. So, uh, right. um, and, and I don't know about shear on specific types on longitudinally uh, inflammatory <laughs> cells. I, um, not too much. I don't, I don't think we know a whole lot about that, how the individual cells, it's more about their uh, I guess most of the work has been on looking at what's, what works as chemoattractant and alters the local environment to sort of stabilize those cells. Well, hopefully tissue engineering with uh, trying to re uh, refabricate the human uh, vascular wall will be able to give us some of those answers. So I think that's coming uh, pretty soon. So um, let's spend just a few minutes on uh, treatment. Uh, so Cantus clearly was a correlate to this inflammatory concept. And, you know, that was a study that, uh, you know, I think many in the field were looking for. Uh, I mean, overall, I think it was an incomplete study. I mean, it's, it's, uh, the data is there. It's not clear what to do with it in terms of guiding uh, more treatment. So, Chiara, you're thinking of treatments uh, for using repurposing different uh, medications uh, for atherosclerosis. So how has Cantus helped you with this? Well, uh, <clears throat> as you said, uh, everyone was looking for this uh, forward to these results. And, uh, you know, I think um, a lot of people were very happy, uh, even though the results, uh, as you mentioned, they're partial. Uh, you know, we should remember that uh, uh, Cantus targets uh, uh, systemic inflammation. Uh, so um, if you look at at the best results in the Cantos, you have a 25% reduction in non-fatal cardiovascular events, only in people that had the highest uh, uh, CRP, so the most inflamed. So, um, you know, there is a still a lot to do, um, but for sure it sets the idea that if you target specific uh, signaling pathways that are relevant to a specific uh, group of patients, uh, um, you can be effective. Uh, now, uh, the challenge is to identify and uh, it ways to stratify patients in a, in a way that, you know, is effective. Uh, and you need to look for different uh, drugs that can be useful to uh, reduce cardiovascular events and possibly mortality. So um, a way to do it is to use uh, drug repositioning. Uh, 
um, and this is a concept that is, um, you know, uh, emer has emerged uh, and that allows to shorten the drug development significantly. So um, from, uh, um, in drug development, you require almost 20 years, if you are lucky, to identify a drug uh, that is uh, um, effective and bring it to the clinic. Uh, with drug repositioning, you have uh, uh, the ability of using existing drugs that might be orphan drugs because not effective for the purpose they were developed or, 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 or effective for other indications, but uh, um, uh, not known uh, for, uh, for it, their efficacy uh, for other indications. So using uh, uh, these emerging data sets and system biology that seems to be very important in identify the key um, targets that um, affect the whole bunch of cellular communication and signaling pathway, you can uh, identify new drugs and uh, bring it to, to the lab, test them, uh, and uh, shorten this uh, transition to clinical trial. Uh, so I think it might be very useful to use these approaches to um, speed up uh, drug discovery, and uh, um, we are using these. Uh, um, up, we, we are using testing two drugs right now that we identify using these uh, new methodologies, uh, and so far they are, you know, doing well in preclinical phase. Uh, but I think we should exploit the, resource, the resources more uh, because it might be very useful. Uh, um, but we have to keep in mind that there are different uh, considerations to make. And first of all, uh, target systemic inflammation versus more specific immune responses that might be more complicated to target because, you know, you have to reach the right side and, and so on. And at the same time, not pa every patient at every stage is equal. Uh, so we have to keep in mind that a lot of what we know comes from end-stage disease and might not necess necessarily apply to early stage of the disease. So we have to apply this uh, uh, system biology and te new techniques that we have now available at different stages of the disease, I think. Thank you. Dr. King, over the last uh, decade or so, as some of these drugs that are, have purported uh, anti-inflammatory effects, uh, whether it's cholesterol agents or other types of agents, cardiovascular agents, do you, f do, you, do you think that the types of lesions that you're seeing are different uh, or is it age dependent? I mean, we did do two trials, uh, the yellow study uh, yellow one and yellow two, where mm -hmm. we use statins. So I think at the end of this lecture, I want people to leave this room uh, not knowing that they're full of inflammation and there's no medicine to take. And uh, the one medicine I think which everybody, most of people are on, which is statin and works very well. The reason I say that is in the yellow one, what we did is we took obstructive lesions who were FFR positive and then put them on uh, statin to understand uh, we did the imaging. So the what imaging we did was to see what exactly is the morphology of these obstructive lesions. We all know non-obstructive lesions definitely have cholesterol in them. So we could image and see what cholesterol looked like, and it, uh, def it looked uh, yellow. It was a particular a special catheter we used. And then we put them on high-dose statin, randomized to regular dose, uh, you know, um, statin versus high-dose, which was uh, uh, Rosua statin, 40 milligram, followed them up to eight weeks, and then re-imaged them. So what was interesting is we took all comers. So this is what the initial uh, question was, that if you take all comers and you take obstructive lesion, where we are talking more than 80% uh, disease and uh, FFR positive, only 30% of those uh, patients, I would say that 70% of them had definite yellow plug and about 30% of them were in the later stages of their disease, which means the lipid has been removed out, no more uh, your foam cells, and it was a uh, fibrous plaque inside them, and on top of that, probably some uh, calcium. So we definitely know that uh, statin works in this patient as seen by uh, systemic inflammatory markers and uh, decreased in LDL. So what we did in the second trial was to exactly understand how, I know we know in vitro study is something else versus in vivo is something else. What happens to these patients when they get statin? How exactly is that cholesterol removed from the vessel? 
And we all know that uh, one of them is uh, efflux, which uh, HDL is very important part of the uh, efflux, although none of the HDL trials was positive. In fact, they were uh, negative trials. Uh, so we wanted to see if you have not um, extrinsic HDL, your own body HDL, which means you have to do a lot of lifestyle modification to get your HDL uh, go up. J just by statin, maybe 5%, 6% change in HDL. But what was interesting we found in yellow two was that by when we did the imaging and compared it to the cholesterol efflux capacity, not only did the cholesterol level go down, it correlated well with your fibrous cap thickness. That is why OCT was important i.e. the baseline is that if your plaque thickness uh, decreases, changes, your cholesterol level goes down, your inflammatory markers goes down, your fibrous cap becomes uh, thicker, which means you become from an uh, inflamed plaque to a stable plaque. And uh, that is what we found. And we also did was a, a transcriptome uh, analysis to find is there any genetic marker that we can correlate these changes to where we found about at least six genes uh, related to cholesterol uh, efflux as well as uh, inflammatory markers uh, that they definitely that there is uh, upregulation of this gene in these patients who are responders and the good news is majority of them are responders. So you've heard it from the trenches right there. So uh, thank you Dr. Keeney for uh, that. Roger, if you allow me two comments. One, is I want to tell you that the most pro-inflammatory agent that we have in our body is called oxidized LDL. So therefore, if the statins lower the cholesterol and lower the oxidized LDL, they are anti-inflammatory. I don't call it inflammatory, anti-inflammatory. The thing that we have to do because until you don't have cholesterol in your wall, you have monocytes. In the moment that you have cholesterol is when the monocyte is converted into macrophages. So if you affect the cholesterol, you lower the inflammatory stimuli. And second, let me help the HDL. All of you know that I love the HDL. And I want always to say the same thing, and I recommend you to read, to read the letter that we wrote to JAMA after the, la the latest study with the HDL mimetics. You have to read the articles. If you give a drug that wants to raise the HDL, make sure that you raise EPOI-1 make sure that you do not raise the HDL cholesterol. Because the HDL cholesterol is what, if you have a lot of cholesterol in a, an HDL, is what we call it dysfunctional HDL. And, we, and you already mentioned it, if you have a good flux, it's protective. So the problem is that today we don't know how to raise the functional HDL. We are able to increase the levels of dysfunctional HDL, and we don't, do that is forget it because in this study that Nichols and, and Nissen they publish in JAMA, you know, if when you read the article, the placebo group has a 6% of increase in HDL and the treated group has only one. I mean, is this a treatment to, and the conclusion is the HDLs are dead, but they didn't do it. So, and at least in, uh, in vitro studies, if you use the right HDL, that the right HDL is the isolated from a 20 years old healthy individual, the endothelial cells, they respond like an anti-inflammatory reaction. If you take the HDL from a patient with established cardiovascular disease and you put it in this endothelial cells, they generate a pro atherosclerotic <coughs> reaction. So this is one of the things. And basically, what is my recipe to uh, as a therapeutic agent against high levels of inflammation, control all the cardiovascular risk factors. And then you will be able to lower the inflammation. And this is clear because you know that even the PCSK9 drugs works mostly in the patient with more than 100 milligrams of deciliter. And remember what I said before, cholesterol is pro-inflammatory. If you have high levels, you have inflammation. You lower the cholesterol, you are anti-inflammatory. Thank you. Okay, so maybe we can open it up to the uh, audience here today. So, um, there's a way of kind of turning this on its head. I mean, we put out all the phenotypes on the table, and it's very beautiful and busy. But uh, two things. From experience, 
sometimes you find patients who are hyperlipidemic and terrible lifestyle, and you do studies, and they have no intimal medial thickness, they have no uh, calcification, and you're stunned. Uh, kind of the second point is recently in JAMA, there were a series of studies on biologic targets for aging. And they talk about a whole bunch of NIH grants studying the problem of aging in, in mice and humans. And they come to the conclusion that in animals, they can find genes that not only prolong life, but make the animals healthier. And they look at centenarians who die of old age. They don't have heart disease. They don't have cancer. They have remarkable wellness you know, throughout their life, despite the fact that they may be drinking or obese, et cetera. So the question is, in addition to studying the phenotypes of sick people, how about studying the genotypes of people who are unexpectedly well against all odds? So, so I, I mean, I think there's a, certainly an evidence, and a lot of issues in that, and, and you know, the term resilience has come up right from NIH, and uh, Gary Gibbons and Herman Taylor have both spoken about that. And, um, it actually comes up in minority health, too. When you look at underrepresented minority, we talk about African Americans having a higher risk of hypertension and, and hypertensive disease. But, but if you look at the risk profile in African Americans, it's, it's bimodal. And there are these, um, you know, 190-year-olds who are fantastically healthy. And, and I think you're right to look at the resilience of those individuals and not what makes you more vulnerable disease, but what makes you more resistant. I, I think that's really a fascinating area. And, and one that's relatively unexplored, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's important to say, so this work's actually going on here. So through the genetics department, and I'm involved as one of the team, but Burek Shat and a guy called Jason Bobay, we have this program of taking these patients with ex extreme sort of protection against cardiovascular risk factors, if, for example, you know, LDLs of three, 400, but total absence of atherosclerosis. And we're doing deep phenotyping on them to see what is their mechanism of protection from atherosclerosis in this case, or it may be other diseases. So if you have any of these patients, and this applies to anybody that for whatever reason, you know, should have severe disease, but don't, please let me know, because we have a program up and running actually to phenotype these patients, genotype them, sequence them, and understand what's protective, because potentially whatever is protecting them might be a fantastic therapy. The other thing to say is that uh, in the parallel line also going on at Sinai is using the BioMe biorepository. As you know, there's, there's thousands of patients that have had DNA sequence now from Sinai. We're actually able to go through the electronic medical record and find patients with extremely low cholesterol levels, low LDL, that are not taking statins. Those patients, patients are now genotyped and when we find rare variants that are actually causal for this low ALDL, we can actually then bring them into the clinic. They're often healthy, and we can actually check that they're healthy and normal. And if you can actually mutate the gene, which these patients have done, mutate a gene, have very low cholesterol, but yet actually be walking and talking and normal, this already is proof of concept that that would be a great gene to target as a therapy because it doesn't actually cause adverse clinical effects. So changing the gene is, is associated with a normal phenotype. So this work is going on, and if you have any of these patients, any of you, please let me know, and we can put them into the program. Let me just ask you, in flu season, as you know, coronary disease just goes way up, and people with congestive heart failure die quicker, basically, when hospitalized in the flu season. So this doesn't say anything specifically about how inflammation works. It just says that basically it's such a generalized inflammation that that's going to start that. It doesn't help in terms of deciding factors that are involved that might, in terms of infectious uh, markers, that might help to understand better inflammation. Uh, so, uh, so that, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, you're absolutely right. There's this strong association between flu season with worsening, um, you know, increased number of infarcts and STEMIs and heart failure death. And, and, you know, it is complicated. Some of it might not be inflammation. Some of it also might be sort of the other humoral milieu that comes with being ill, right, with the catecholamines being elevated, et cetera. Uh, people, you know, uh, all sorts of things go on, right? Your, your physiology is very very alter, dramatically altered. But it's, it's likely that inflammation plays a role. Uh, one of my mentors once told me, he said, just don't forget inflammation wasn't designed to give you atherosclerosis. It was designed to protect you from your world. And, uh, and the atherosclerosis is sort of an afterthought. Uh, 
Dr. Darwin doesn't care much about us after we're about 21. And, uh, and so a lot of these, you know, protective mechanisms clearly have, uh, you know, pro-inflammatory effects, which are bad for atherosclerosis, but inflammation in and of itself, remember, is protective uh, during disease states. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, well, we'd like to thank the panel for its exciting. Oh, sorry. I just wondered if the, the failure of the methotrexate versus the kinecatamab, does that give you some help in terms of deciding on what sort of inflammatory markers are important and some are not so important? Not all the inflammation is the same. This is what they said at the beginning, because with, in the cantos, they attack a very specific inflammatory pathway, and it did work. The problem is that because we went against our defensive mechanism, the patients, they didn't die from cardiovascular diseases, and they die from septicemia. They die, anyhow. But they told us that it's not the same thing to give a wide spectrum anti-inflammatory like metotexate or, or colchicine rather than going to market. And I, I guess that this is what I said at the beginning. Until we don't identify or we don't define the inflammatory pathway, it's going to be very difficult to get the therapy. Because we know that giving like one size fits all Oh. That's some work. So yeah. we need to do more studies, whether it's with the cell to cell or with the biological uh, networks. Once we know what is the inflammatory marker responsible for cardiovascular inflammation, then maybe we will talk in a different way. Then I will change my position. But otherwise, given to a pan anti inflammatory, it's not going to work. Dr. Gianarelli, do you have any thoughts on that? I agree with Dr. Badimon. Uh, I mean, uh, the take home message is that we need to be very specific and uh, we need to identify signaling pathway that I would like to use the word we want to modulate and we don't want to neutralize uh, because we, um, you know, we don't want to have side effects like um, infections and, and so on. So we, we want to preserve the proper uh, ability of respond to inflammatory stimuli um, without, um, you know, uh, creating an immune compromised patient. So um, I think this is the real challenge. And until we understand more how to set this balance, uh, um, it's also going to be very difficult to um, be effective in a large scale uh, population. Um, in, in terms of identifying pathways and new targets, I think, um, you know, as I mentioned before, that it's important to stratify patients. So uh, we also need to, um, to do this exercise more uh, because we can't spread uh, the same uh, immunotherapies to everybody um, because it doesn't, inflammation it's probably not going to be the same at different stage of the disease. Um, after lipids trigger an inflammatory response that most likely is initially responsive, but it might become uh, not lipid related. And this is what probably the Cantos trial te uh, teaches us, is that you have regardless in patients that are well treated with statin, you still have uh, a residual cardiovascular risk that it's related to inflammation. So we need to learn how to uh, target these uh, inf residual inflammation. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.